Hello, my name is James Martin and I am an idiot. This year I decided to buy myself a new daily driver and because I can now finance things because I actually earn money from YouTube, I had a little bit more budget than I originally anticipated. I first bought a Jaguar XJR but it didn't go so well, so I replaced it instead with a Maserati Quattroporte Sport GTS, and I've rather enjoyed it. However, one of the other cars I nearly got was this, the Lexus GSF, and I have to say, on the face of it, it does look a little bit like I might have made the wrong decision, because there's an awful lot to like about this Lexus. In the UK, Lexus is really, in general, a very niche brand. We buy very few of them. So sporty Lexus in particular, or Lexi, as Alan Partridge would call it, are a rare breed. Even ignoring for a moment the ludicrous dominance of German cars here in the UK, you can see why the GSF was always going to be a little bit of an oddball. This had a rather old school 5 litre naturally aspirated V8 putting out a respectable 470 horsepower. However, that was less than even the previous generation M5 and was outgunned by some 100 horsepower or so with the new one. The body shell was not particularly lightweight, although I suspect this was actually lighter than the M5, weighing in at just over 1,800 kilos versus the M5's near two tons. Styling is somewhat controversial. A lot of people aren't a fan, but I'll be honest, I am. Quite like the blend of angles, and I really love this blue, which, if I'm honest, is the only color I would have this car in. They were also not particularly cheap cars, costing just over £70,000 when new. But all these years later, and now, the F10 M5 is about the cheapest you can find, with prices from less than 20000 quid. However, every time I see a GSF come up for sale, it commands a good solid £32,000 to £33,000, if not some more. Why is that then? Well, first off, of course, you'll have the rarity. But after that, you'll also have the fact that this car is quite good. This car has been brought to me by the lovely Douglas and Kate, and they run a car club called the Prestige and Performance Club. I'll put a little link in the description down below, so if you want to know a little bit more about that, please do go and check out their site. First impressions really are very decent. Now, it doesn't have quite as much luxurious leather and Alcantara as my Maserati. This should be a bit nicer than it is, same really for the headliner, but it's okay. The steering wheel's rather nice, there's plenty of carbon in here, you have a nice clock, but you do also have the world's most infuriating navigation system for the menu. The LC500 got a lot of flack for its little sort of touchpad thing, but actually I think that was far better than this, which has a little sort of square thing you kind of move around like a joystick, but it's got the most horrid action, and I'm absolutely amazed that the Japanese ever signed it off. It seems like something they, they really wouldn't let go. Compared with my own Maserati that, granted, is a few years older, you've got some more luxury, so a lot more technology up here, very nice dash, and you even have cooled as well as heated seats. I have neither. The engine responds nicely, and in regular automatic mode, this eight-speed Toyota gearbox is quite nice. The ride, though, not so much. It's fixed-rate dampers in here, I believe, and it's very firm. I think even firmer than the Maserati, which also has a very sporty fixed-rate setup. You've also got a heads-up display here, which is very nice, clear, easy to read, and features not just your speed, but also your rev counter, which will go up to just over 7,000. I have had the pleasure of experiencing this engine in a number of other products, and it is a real peach. Here, as I said, it produces about 470 horsepower, so a little bit down on what the LC500 then made, and around 390 pound-feet of torque. It's about 530 newton meters. The steering is surprisingly light. I thought it would be just that little bit better. However, this car does have some driving modes. I'm currently in normal, so we'll wind it straight through to Sport Plus, put my foot in, and see what happens. Also going to move over to manual.
Furney Circle is actually really good, better even than the Nissan Figaro I've just got out of. Strange, but true. Throttle response is very odd. It's weirdly blunted, and I really don't know why. It's naturally aspirated, it should be absolutely sensational, but there is a definite disconnect between the pedal and the engine. It feels like something's broken. Honestly, you put your foot down, and then a moment later, it actually responds. That gearbox also is just a shade shy of true greatness. It changes quick, but it doesn't respond fast. And the problem is that this engine really needs to be in the top 3,000 RPM of its range, over four grand, to actually get its best work done. And that means you do want to be changing gear fairly frequently. It is certainly much more agile than my Italian. With the Maserati, it's really more of an S-Class or 7-series rival, so when you start to push on, you, you do realise there's some serious weight it's carrying. This, far more capable in a bend. Yeah, that gearbox is bizarre very surprised at that really didn't think it would be this slow considering this is actually a pretty recent car so they came out in 2016 and were on sale for a few years unlike the germans getting a performance car out of the japanese seems more like the exception rather than the rule it never really appears to be a part of their plan and they're quite happy to let a long period of time go past without anything on offer look at honda with the civic type r and the nsx even more so and lexus are no different now, while that may make sense for the UK, where we don't really buy many of these, in the USA I don't understand it because the idea of a big, fast, Japanese-made V8 cruiser, well, that's the perfect car for America. So why there isn't one of these on sale at all times just baffles me. I know that it's very possible to do some pretty leery things with these, because I've seen Chris Harris doing it, but I am not Chris Harris, and this is not a gorgeous mountain road in Wales, nor is it my own private test track, so some caution has to be exercised. The car does have a torque vectoring limited slip differential, but in truth, in the dry, on the road, at sensible speeds, you're probably never going to notice it. In the wet and on track, more so I'm sure, but here, no. I will say, this does sound absolutely amazing. Now I do believe there is some active sound design going on in here, piping the sound through the speakers, especially in its sporty modes. But from outside, this car's actually also very well judged. The volume is pitch perfect. And it's got that really nice cultured sound. It is not averse to lighting up its rear tyres in Sport Plus, apparently. And the steering's a real disappointment. It's so light. The Maserati at speed actually gains some weighting to it and becomes much more interesting. So although this car has much higher dynamic limits, the Maserati's actually the more engaging drive. I actually did the drive-bys before this bit of the review, which is unusual for me. And I have to say that up until about now, I felt like with the Maserati, I had really made the wrong choice, hence my earlier confession of being an idiot. Unfortunately, having made the right choice of the Maserati doesn't actually change the fact that I'm, I'm an idiot, because I definitely am. I, I made YouTube my career. Uh, talking about cars on YouTube, my career is, a, is a, a double blunder, surely. But there are other things in the Lexus favour. It feels extremely well made. It's also really good on fuel. This pulls the same trick as other cars in the Lexus range, where it can run on something called the Atkinson cycle. And that means this car on the run here did 33 to the gallon. That's fantastic. The leather in here is also really nice. I love the seat designs. It does feel about 10 years newer in here than the Maserati. This particular car does not have a sunroof, which is one of the very few options you could actually specify with one of these. Compared with the Maserati, boot space I think here is also a lot better. The Mazda follows the same S-Class 7 Series tradition of not having anywhere near as much space as you would expect. These seats are also much better than those in the Maserati, which look lovely and are comfortable, but will not hold you in for toffee. You also get the impression that this thing will just last absolutely forever. However, if this were my one and only car, I think its dynamic failings would be quite difficult to forgive. But, and does make up for it with a lot 
of personality. And to be honest, many an M5 that I've driven isn't exactly bristling with feel either, so perhaps this isn't quite the crime I'm making it out to be. And I always have a genuine love and appreciation of the unusual, the underdog, it's a very British thing I will admit, and this is certainly that. I have to say a big thank you to Kate and Douglas for bringing their car out at very, very late notice. And I, I was concerned that this might be a rather expensive experiment for me. Because you see, one of the reasons I didn't buy one of these first time round is that I worried I was perhaps stretching myself a little bit with the Maserati as it was at 26,000 pounds. And one of these would have been about another really seven to 10 more. And it's probably built seven to 10,000 pounds better, but I don't want it seven to 10,000 pounds more. So, there's a brief little look at what I think would make a very interesting alternative to an M5. Would it better it in the minds of many? I don't think so. But is it worth trying? Yeah, I'd say so. Thanks to you all for watching. Please like, comment down below, subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you for the next one. Bye-bye.